time. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I work in the Digital Humanities Institute, uh, where I try to tell other people how to do clever things with computers uh, so they can tell me exciting things about language. Great job. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you about tonight is a story uh, from back when I was doing my PhD. And my PhD was in uh, the department, as it then was, of biblical studies. I looked at the book of Ruth. The story I'm going to tell you today is the story of a sweet, old woman. The Book of Ruth. Four chapters, 85 verses in the middle of the Bible. I got a PhD out of 85 verses. <laughs> I suggest to you that the Book of Ruth begins really as a story of trauma. Famine forces a family, mom, dad, two sons, to leave their home in Bethlehem and journey to Moab, enemy territory. At first, they seem to thrive. The sons marry local women. But by verse 5, all the men are dead. <laughs> <laughs> so Naomi, we're left with Naomi, the, the widowed mother, and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. And as luck would have it, at this point, Naomi hears that there is now food back in Bethlehem. So she sets out to return. And Orpah and Ruth go with her. Well, part way along, Naomi stops, she turns and she says to them, go home, back to your own mothers, find husbands there, as if with one voice they respond saying, no, we will return with you to your people. And Naomi really doesn't seem to want this because she, she raises all of her energy into this super long speech and she says, why? Why would you go with me? Have I got more sons to be husbands for you? Even if we imagine that I met a man right now and got pregnant and they were boys, are you seriously telling me that you would wait for newborn husbands? And in Hebrew, at this point, her speech reaches an alliterative climax. She says to them, no, no. And I'm going to give you, well, the Hebrew is ma li ma od mikem. But in the King James Version, she says, it grieveth me greatly for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. It grieveth me greatly for your sakes. Well, in the 1780s, the preacher John McGowan was writing and trying to preach on this text, and he said... Naomi is an excellent lesson for parents in preferring the good of their children ahead of their own desires. Naomi, an excellent lesson for parents. Here she was, putting Ruth and Orpah's situation ahead of her own, grieving greatly, not for her loss, but for their sakes. Well, Orpah was convinced. She turned and went home. But Ruth, she stuck to Naomi. And she claimed her allegiance in words so powerful, you might hear them like wedding vows. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your God is my God. Where you are buried, I'm buried. Powerful words to a woman who has lost husband and sons buried in a foreign land. A sweet old woman, this generous, excellent lesson. 
Naomi's name in Hebrew means sweetness, my sweet, sweetie we might call her. But maybe there's another side to her story, because if you continue to read McGowan's commentary, he's forced to observe that some people read those words, Marley, my old Mikem, as it's more bitter for me than for you. Not Naomi worrying about the sakes of Ruth and Orpah, but saying, you know, it's really rubbish, my situation. <laughs> Quite different pictures. And as a PhD student, I was trying to fathom where these different pictures were coming from. Um, and I sat down to talk about this with my PhD supervisor, um, puzzling over the different ways one could read Naomi. Um, and I was particularly thinking at that point about this for your sakes. Um, and my PhD supervisor sort of said to me, well, how does it mean that? And I kind of scratched my head because I was, you know, clearly this is my PhD supervisor. This had to be a serious question. But the thing is, if you go and look in the, in the dictionary, Brown, Driver and Briggs Dictionary of, of Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, and you look up the little word mikem, which, uh, you know, and you, and you get, you look through the entry, right? Um, and you get there and it says Ruth 113, for your sakes. So the OED equivalent for those people learning biblical Hebrew, as I did, uh, frighteningly many years ago, um, it said, for your sakes. That, you know, that was the meaning of mikem in that verse in the Bible. So I was kind of puzzled because I knew that I wasn't going to get a PhD out of saying, see the, see the dictionary. <laughs> uh, so I had to do a bit more work. Um, and as I was doing that work, I found myself moving gradually backwards in time. And in fact, I only got to McGowan truthfully at the point that um, I was trying to think, well, where, where are these interpretations coming from? And as I moved backward and backward, I eventually found myself in the middle of the 16th century. Well, it wasn't literally in the middle of the 16th century. In fact, I was in uh, the so-called Oriental Books Room at the British Library in London, and I was sat there with this small yellow book from the 1550s. And this is a book written by a man called Johann Isaac Levito. He was uh, born Jewish, trained as a rabbi, and he converted as an adult uh, to Christianity. Um, and this little book was a kind of textbook for learning Hebrew through the Book of Ruth. Fabulous, okay? Because I'm beginning to wonder, how did people learn Hebrew? Was their Hebrew just not very good, maybe? Because I'd begun to feel that maybe the reason my supervisor had asked me that question was because it wasn't such a good translation, for your sake. So I'm sitting there with this small yellow book, and to be honest, it's a pretty dry book because most of what it's doing is what we technically call parsing. So it's telling you uh, the parts of speech. So this is a noun, um, and it's a singular noun, um, and it's got this bit on the end of it that's giving you some extra information, that kind of thing. Really, so quite technical. But I'm turning through and I'm looking for my verse, verse 30. And glory be, because there's this huge footnote. Like, and I'm telling you, this commentary is as dry as dust. Like, it's got an entry for practically every word in the book of Ruth. So 85 verses, let's say 10 words a verse, 850 words. <laughs> um, but I get, you know, there's this huge long footnote, all on my phrase. And what is this footnote saying? Well, Johann Isaac is attacking um, another uh, Bible translator, and I'm going to try and uh, say so this is a Latin commentary, but I'm going to tell you in English what he said. So he says, he says, I cannot help but wonder how my fellow eminent Bible translator could possibly translate the words Marlim Od Mikem, greatly for your sake I suffer. I mean, in, in no way whatsoever can that sense be reconciled with the Hebrew. I mean, who is there, Isaac says, who is there of the learned in the Hebrew tongue who does not know that ma means acerbic or bitter? 
and that mechem is a comparison, meaning than you. Well, now I have somebody who is clearly evidencing their Hebrew expertise um, in the middle of the 16th century, and I'm beginning to get a different question because maybe you know what I've done doesn't really answer my my uh, uh, supervisor's question because it's only explaining how it could mean something else, not how it could mean for your sakes. But I've got somebody asking that same question as my supervisor. Well, how how would it possibly mean that? Um, so I continue working backward. And you know, if you've got a question about the Bible and Bible translation and you've landed in the 16th century, then at some point you are going to find yourself on the door of Martin Luther. <laughs> uh, famous Bible translator, uh, but famous really because we blame him for the Reformation. <laughs> uh, the Reformation uh, begins in our account of it with Luther protesting against bad stuff that the church is doing. Um, and he wants it to stop doing that bad stuff. But uh, there's an unwillingness to listen, or people don't understand what Luther's saying, um, and eventually uh, we end up with a split in the Western church. But along the way, Luther's trying to tell the church, you're doing it wrong. They don't want to listen, and the church has been the authority for everybody. So if he's challenging that authority, where's he going to get his authority from? And as Luther puzzles this out, he's actually getting his authority from the Bible. And so he comes up with this principle, sola scriptura, just what God said, right? Just scripture. That's, that's where our authority is going to come from. You know, ignore all that tradition, ignore the Pope. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, so, so far, right, okay, so the Bible is the answer. But what if the Bible's the question? How does it help you as a Bible translator to be told, well, that's the answer. How do you know what, how to translate the Hebrew? You know, where, where do you, it's a complicated question, and I'm not going to pretend that there aren't Bible translators who go to other bits of the Bible to work out what the Bible says. That's, that's a very normative, circular practice. Uh, but the question is still there. You know, how do you know if you're looking at a text and, you know, what it says? What's your authority if you can't go to the church and to tradition and to the Pope? Um, and I began to realise that actually part of the answer for people uh, living through the 16th century, and in fact I would argue for, for a Bible translator today, was to go to their own experience and to think, well, what is the excellent lesson here? Because of course the Bible contains excellent lessons. Surely we all know it's full of them. Um, so the reason that we encounter that generous Naomi, who is preoccupied with Ruth and with Orpah, the reason that is the dominant translation that comes through in the King James Version, King James Version that's there in the, the Hebrew learners' OED, is because that was the one, the answer society wanted. That was the convenient uh, picture uh, of women and of relationships between, uh, fantastically enough, mother-in-laws and their, da their daughters-in-law. Um, so what can I say? Beware the excellent lesson. <laughs>